I am uh, Bruce Burns, and I wish to uh, start by thanking Lieutenant Colonel Siri of the West Point Center of Oral History and Dr. Steve Waddell, who allowed us to give this presentation in his World War II history class to the cadets of the United States Military Academy at West Point on October 17, 2016. Lieutenant Colonel Siri then interviewed Mr. Resta for more than two hours and the interview will be able to be accessed through the West Point Center of Oral History site so that future generations will have an opportunity to hear the words of my friend Francis Resta. I came into the Army at age 39 after 9-11 and had my first deployment in Iraq in 2003. At that time, combat stress teams were attached to forward combat units. I spent my deployment driving all over Fallujah and Ramadi doing critical incident debriefings and psych assessments. As the Army's psych psychiatric therapist for the unit, I was attached to the 3rd ACR and Fox Troop. Our battle captain, Josh Byers, West Point class of 1996, was killed by one of the first IEDs in Fallujah at the end of July. He had just rotated in, so I didn't know him well. My driver was wounded by RPG, so I was driving my Humvee when it was hit by an IED a week later. While it killed a dump truck driver across the other side, it hardly scratched the door of my Humvee. I was back in the States 10 days after the attack and was trying to find someone to talk to about my experience. I joined the BFW and learned that many veterans don't want to talk much. There were more World War II veterans then, and I remember my 12-year-old son asking a Battle of the Bulge vet what it had been like. Cold, was his reply. Then I met Francis, who told me he had written a book called The Combat Veteran and PTSD, but wasn't sure if it was any good, in, enough technically to be used by the Veterans Administration for their treatment of PTSD. I took the book with me to Afghanistan for my sixth deployment and felt it helped the combat soldiers due to its plain language and deep understanding. Francis was an engineer and also had some psychology schooling that helped design work teams in Detroit auto industry to work together as teams. He worked for Aerojet <coughs> and later for the United States Air Force at Mather and Travis Air Force bases as the Industrial Engineer Branch Chief in the Civil Engineering Division. His outside passion for flying led him to the Civil Air Patrol as a civilian pilot, and he flew search and rescue missions for over the Sierra Nevada Mountains for the Air Force for 18 years in the 60s and 70s. He was squadron commander of Mather a AFB CAP for 32 years. While I hope our presentation will give you an eyewitness account of one of the Army's most brutal battles, I hope you will focus on his company commander, Captain George L. Kinsey. I challenged the cadets at West Point to be the kind of leaders who would be remembered 72 years later. On this 75th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack, I will be giving an account of the forgotten battle in the European theater at a town called Welts, Germany. While these events may have little in common, both of them were disasters from lack of military intelligence, which resulted in great loss of life. On Pearl Harbor Day, I was a 16-year-old boy growing up at West Point. My father had been stationed there as officer in charge of the music programs. Before that time, he had been stationed at Fort Shafter on Oahu, so Pearl Harbor was a real place to me, and I took the attack personally. This slide shows my family home at Quarters 11 West Point on my three-day pass from Fort Dix just before shipping overseas, August 1944. Living there at West Point was a wonderful life for any child. I am forever grateful to have grown up there and for the Army life. When we gave this talk to the cadets at West Point last month, I felt like I was closing a circle. We gave our talk in a classroom at the converted horseback riding hall. I started there learning how to ride horseback. 
in that very building 75 years ago, and I was back there again, honored to be briefing the future officers of our country's military. Just before I graduated from high school, I had scored high enough on the Army and Navy specialized college program tests to be in the Navy program, which I selected. I rushed home to proudly announce the news, which I had expected would be received with much rejoicing. My mom, however, looked more stricken than I had ever seen her. With a flushed face and flashing eyes, she said, not the Navy. She had been a resolute Army wife for 20 years. So I changed my selection to the Army College program, which Colonel Burns will discuss next. In World War II, if a high school senior scored well enough on the equivalent of the ASVAB, he might be given the option of going to OCS and becoming a lieutenant. However, if he scored high enough, he could join the ASTP, the Army Specialized Training Program, and go to college with the E1 stipend and become an engineer, linguist, or something the Army felt it might have need for. RESTA's 102nd Infantry Division was partly the product of politics leading up to the 1944 presidential re-election year. At the end of 1943, Congress decided, rather than start drafting fathers, the military would pull the 110,000 students out of the ASTP program and put them in infantry divisions. The 102nd Division was composed of the 405th, 406th, and 407th Regiments, along with ancillary troops making up an infantry division of about 16,000 men. Half of its troops came from the ASTP program. The other half, the cadre, were from the Army Organized Reserve in Missouri and Arkansas. They were called the Ozark Division. The 102nd was in combat for 196 days without a break in Holland, Germany, and yet for Francis Resta's regiment, the 407th, one day, November 30th, 1944, was the worst. On that day, the 407th suffered 57% casualties assaulting the Siegfried Line in western Germany. In our talk today, we will focus on November 30th battle and will follow one scared, barely 19-year-old young soldier throughout the day of battle. After you have heard this talk, perhaps you will understand what would haunt this soldier enough to write the book, The Combat Soldier and PTSD. The 102nd was the first uh, U.S. division to go to France without first stopping in England for training. When they arrived in Normandy, the Ozark men were briefed that their 9th Army under General Bradley would be an occupation army. The media were promising the war would be over by Christmas in 1944. Captain Kinsey was CEO of the 407th B Company to which Resta belonged. Captain Kinsey thought that although the German army had turned tailed and abandoned all of France, they would be more stubborn when they fought for their homeland. He didn't believe the war was almost over and sensed that the unit would see combat. Captain Kinsey instituted a special training to keep Company B fit while waiting in Normandy. Company B only of the 407th Regiment was formed up daily for 10 mile hikes with light packs and weapons through the beautiful Normandy countryside. Seeing the destruction on the beaches gave the men an introduction to the immense power of combat, not unlike a terrible hurricane. As B Company left each morning for training missions and passed billets of sister units of the 407th Regiment, they got a lot of catcalls. B Company heroes from the units sitting around their tents playing cards and sleeping. B Company responded with a song that one of the men had made up in the States. The men sang it lustily on hikes and at beer drinking parties. It went something like this to an Irish ballad. Oh, we're Captain Kinsey's Raiders, we're the rapers of the night. We're dirty sons of bitches and we'd rather fucking fight. Oh, flim flam, goddamn, who the hell are we? We're rough and ready fighting men of good old Company B. 
Pat McKenzie really liked that song. We sang it over and over. I'm uncomfortable singing that sexist song now, but the song helped make us believe that we were invincible and indestructible. Without such false confidence built up in endless training exercises and briefings, we would not have had the courage to face the insanity of combat. Guylen Kirken was the 102nd Division's introduction to the German Siegfried Line. It had 18,000 bunkers and firing points and ran 400 miles from Switzerland to the Baltic Sea. These fortifications were much more massive than the thin line faced on D-Day. The five-foot-thick reinforced concrete bunkers were impervious to artillery fire and two camouflage for the Air Force bombing. No offshore Navy guns could reach them. The line also included massive lines of anti-tank stumps and deep ditches which made Allied tanks unusable and mines were everywhere. The fortifications were often miles in depth, each one protected by one of, or several others behind it and more behind those and so on, creating horrid, horrendous killing fields. Without tanks to support them and no artillery or bombing to help, the only option was to throw wave after wave of just infantry soldiers against the protected machine guns and canning, losing thousands in each assault. The Rhineland campaign cost 200,000 Allied casualties to breach the Siegfried Line and cross the Rhine River, similar to Operation Overlord, D-Day and the Breakout, which claimed Allied casualties of 210,000. Captain Kinsey was always looking for opportunities to improve his company's fighting capability. After Restus B Company was sent forward to Geilenkirk in Germany, Captain Kinsey learned that a nearby ammo dump had been hit by German artillery and was starting to burn and was about to blow up. He decided it would be a good idea to appropriate some extra weapons. He grabbed three men close by, including Resta, and they jumped in Kinsey's Jeep and raced to the burning quadrangle. They quickly, almost insanely, foraged for jeeps, browning automatic rifles, 30 caliber machine guns, some machine guns, and ammunition. Then they raced out with four jeeps loaded with equipment just as the ammo began to blow up around them. According to Resta, this action added to Captain Kinsey's mystique in B Company as not really being mortal. With the scrounged equipment plus the 50 caliber machine guns scavenged from tanks knocked out on the Cologne plane, Captain Kinsey reorganized the B Company with Resta's mortar section becoming a mobile assault section directly under him. This section was equipped with Jeep mounted 50 caliber machine guns and with mortars carried in the Jeeps. Resta's mortar section was armed with 45 caliber Thompson submachine guns or M3 grease guns. With this new firepower, B Company felt they were even more invincible as they prepared to their, for their attack on Welts. The attack on Welts began for us the day before we jumped off, preparing our equipment, getting extra ammunition for our 60 millimeter mortars, our personal weapons, extra hand grenades, a couple of days food rations, cigarettes, and so on. Endless artillery was coming in day and night so we were living in our foxholes and firing our mortars daily. One night in Gerenschweiler, I was out of my hole and was handed a message to take to Captain Kinsey. He was up in a church steeple watching the artillery show. After I brought him the message, I just, he just started talking to me, didn't excuse me to leave. Kinsey was ecstatic and excited watching the artillery duels going on. He exclaimed how beautiful it was with the German rounds screaming into our area, sometimes very close, and the American artillery whooshing overhead, going out in answer. I was nervous up there high above the ground and exposed as we were. I was much more comfortable in a foxhole or a mortar firing hole, but I guess he needed someone to share what he felt was being fully alive, the excitement of danger, and the power of the artillery. He asked me what I thought of it all. I thought he was crazy, but with an almost worshipful respect for him, I said, it's great. In the briefing for the attack on Welts, we were told only a few machine gun nests were facing us and that it would be an easy fight. 
none of us had heard of the Siegfried Line fortification, so we had no idea what we were actually facing. The plan was to start after midnight and just walk halfway across a beet field in the dark, dig in to wait for morning. It was emphasized that we not make any noise while crossing the field and we're not to return any German fire that might come at us. At daybreak, we jumped off from our slit trenches on signal after the artillery provided a smoke screen. Then our 105 millimeter artillery were to pace the town approaches and fortifications until they were called to stop as we got near. As my platoon prepared to move out that night, we fired one more batch of harassing uh, 60 millimeter mortar fire at Wells as we had done every night for a week to let the Germans know nothing different was happening. The machine gun section quietly moved out with our platoon sergeant, Master Sergeant Slaymaker, leading the way about 100 in the morning. We felt euphoric to be such a part of such a great event. The mortar section was attached to Captain Kinsey as a mini assault platoon with our new submachine guns. However, at the last minute, we were ordered to also carry our mortars and ammo instead of putting them in the jeeps. Apparently, Kinsey had changed his mind about whether the, noise, whether the noisy jeeps that night were really such a good idea. As we moved out in the dark across the beet fields, we came under sporadic light machine gun and rifle fire. The Germans knew we were moving, and the occasional tracer rounds lit up the night with an eerie sort of glow. We couldn't see the few guys who were getting hit, but we heard an occasional yell. Somewhere in that crossing, I jumped into a large artillery blast hole when an overhead artillery round burst nearby and scared me senseless. It was just a reflex, but then I wanted to stay. I remember trying to somehow force my body to melt into the dirt, watching the guys walking past the hole like shadows in the dim light. I had mixed feelings and thoughts of being afraid and a coward. I think my fear of being alone, not with my squad, my buddies, won out, and I suddenly realized I had quit and was a coward. I was hiding. I felt overwhelming guilt, got up and ran hard to catch up with my platoon. I remember how heavy my equipment and backpack load was as I ran in the dark across the uneven beet field, trying to hold everything close so as not to make noise. Later, as we hiked across the field, the tracer rounds zipped between my mortar gunner, Blackie Milano, and me. We both grabbed for each other, thinking the other was hit, but neither were. We were supposed to be sneaking out there under cover of darkness, but it was now obvious that our jump off was no longer a surprise. Still, <clears throat> no change in orders came down. When we were signaled to stop, we started digging in as quietly as possible. Some of the trace of fire seemed to be coming from the left, which puzzled us. It all should have been coming from the woods and welts directly ahead. Eventually, the Germans apparently could see nothing to shoot at, so it was quiet for the next few hours before jump off, and we dozed in our slit trenches. At daybreak, I took the picture, this picture of a mortar barrel as it lay next to the slit trench ahead of me. The photo shows the edges of many slit trenches going off into the distance. It's the only combat picture of mine that survived that day. The jump off at daylight was delayed because there was no smoke screen. We finally were called to jump off anyway. The smoke screen, our artillery rounds, finally started, but it was mostly in the woods in front of us uh, where we were supposed to be going. However, the Germans were zeroing in on us from the left, and there was no smoke to hide in. We all just got up as ordered and started forward. It was the most moving sight in the war for me to see the entire regiment in a multi-layered line off to the right moving forward together. It gave me the feeling that we were absolutely invincible. 
But that feeling only lasted a few moments. Some of us pondered why the heavy machine gun and our artillery fire seemed to be coming from our left, not in front. We also realized that the fire was, we soon realized that the fire was from Tiger tanks of what I learned later was the 10th SS Panzer Division, which was not supposed to be there. We were being cut down from grazing 88 cannon and heavy machine gun fire from the side of our line of attack, which gave them maximum killing effect. Clint Hoyt, one of my best friends who had never seen his newborn son, was killed in front of me, his head blown off. And I just stared for a moment at his body, flopping down as I passed. Staff Sergeant hit our mortar section leader, was cut in two right at his waist with what must have been tank heavy machine gun fire. The top half looked at me as I passed. It seemed his eyes followed mine, but he may have been already dead. Our weapons platoon officer, Lieutenant Martin, went down. We'd been trained not to stop for anyone who fell. Our medic's job was to take care of the wounded, but if you stopped for someone, then two more were down instead of one, and you'd be an unmoving, easy target in a killing field. How we were trained to be so uncaring, I have no idea. There was so much confusion with so many men going down that we were pretty numb, frozen our tracks, stopped cold. We lay down in the beet field and some were trying to get a foxhole started. Our own artillery was firing over our heads into welts, but didn't seem aware of the tanks firing at us off to the north. We were pinned down in the beet field with the 88 fire going clop, clop, clop through the beets and men. The German Tigers were firing solid anti-tank rounds. The confusion and devastation was numbing with guys sort of jerking up out of the beach like rag dolls when they were hit by an 88 round, except rag dolls don't scream. We all knew we couldn't stay out there in the beet fields. We were all hugging the ground until Blackie Milano got up in crazy frustration and screaming started to charge across the beet field toward the rise into town. We all numbly got up and followed him. We'd been uh, trained to never, uh, to all stay together. Uh, Blackie had the 60 millimeter mortar tripod and I had the barrel and Kana had the base plate and the others behind us carried the ammo. Uh, so if anyone was missing, it would put the mortar out of action. As we dumbly got up, it seemed the whole of B Company followed us into a ridiculous charge across the beet field. We finally got across the beet field and into the woods and started up the rise toward Welts. As we worked our way into the woods, we started taking casualties from our own B Company, uh, D Company battalion heavy weapons fire. 81 millimeter mortar and heavy water-cooled machine guns were theirs. They originally had been firing over our heads into the woods, but as the train, terrain rose we, and we moved higher, their fire was hitting us. More men were going down. Once during the attack in those woods, I was admiring the firing pattern of the D Company's 81 millimeter mortars landing amongst us, traversing almost perfectly. The explosions marched, marched regularly up to us, over us, and then on past us with evenly spacing. I was trying to take a picture when one round landed right in front of me, blowing me six feet back into a haystack. Somehow I was unscathed, but the photo op was ruined. In the middle of that chaos, Captain Kinsey signaled from across a clearing for the mortars to fire flares. He was desperate to try anything to signal D Company's heavy weapons and the artillery to stop firing. He couldn't communicate because our walkie-talkies and backpack radios were all knocked out or the men dead. We mortar men were confused why he would want flares in the daytime. So I ran across the clearing to Kinsey and jumped into the depression he was in. 
to verify that he wanted flares. He was very angry and yelled at me, yes, do it. I quickly ran back across the clearing. And we rushed to set up two mortars and fire flares. But they disappeared in the smoke above us. We had no effect to stop D Company fire coming in, and more guys were going down. We were taking German fire from the Tiger tanks and the pillboxes as well. Months later, my squad leader, Sergeant Hapman, told me a German machine gun had been firing all around me, trying to hit me, but mostly behind me on, as I ran across the clearing. He told me he put me in for a bronze star, but the medals don't always get down to company level. I don't think it was heroic anyway, since I didn't know they were shooting at me, and what's heroic about just running across a clearing. Thinking about it later, I've never been able to imagine how the D Company men could just keep pumping all that firepower into the rise before wells and never look at what the fire, where the fire was going. Not even one man. And if the officers who weren't busy firing anything weren't looking either, what the hell were they doing? My, at one point, as we carefully tried to work our way uphill, I saw a German out in the woods trying to surrender with his hands raised and his helmet gone. I remember screaming for someone to give me a weapon. I don't know what had happened to mine. In the confusion of combat, you don't think very well or remember everything that's going on. You aren't really making decisions. You just react as you're trained to. And in our training, I didn't carry a submachine gun. I finally got back my weapon, or maybe I had it all along, but the German had already been shot. I couldn't see him anymore after my screaming spell. My job as mortar gunner made combat feel at times sort of mechanical. Only our squadron leader could see through field glasses the Germans we were trying to kill as we fired our mortars and he observed and sometimes told us what was happening. We sometimes heard about kills from returning patrols who had seen Germans blown up by our barrages. That left us with a weird kind of frustration. We were supposed to be killing Germans, but never really knew if or how many. It wasn't a, a hands-on kind of killing like the riflemen and machine gunners uh, in the company were doing. So. We weren't sure we were pulling our weight in the basic denomination of killing Germans. As we got to the outskirt of Waltz at the top of the rise, our 105 artillery, which had been firing over our heads, now was landing on us in addition to the German 88s. I don't know how the Germans could stand our 105s, which they endured throughout the European campaigns, it numbed us into confusion and inaction. We huddled in the first buildings we came to, which were being blown down around us. The Germans were still using solid rounds, which just kept going through the buildings. We'd listen to the clop, 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 trying to figure out if it was coming toward our building. But at least we had buildings and walls to hide behind if we could figure out what direction all the artillery fire was not coming from. I think my B Company was the first into Wells, while most of the battalion was probably still pinned down out in the beet fields. We didn't see anyone for hours. I doubt the command section had any idea we made it into Wells. Next slide. Master Sergeant Slaymaker, now leading the assault platoon into Wells, signaled us to move into cover and we he went on with the light machine guns to set up a defensive perimeter on the other side of Wells, our, our objective. The mortar men who made it that far went into one house. We were not only shell-shocked, but leaderless, so we bunched together like a bunch of dumb recruits. We'd been trained not to touch anything anywhere, not even dead German bodies, because booby traps were everywhere. But when my squad entered the kitchen, one of the guys just walked up to the stove and opened his door. It must have been some kind of mindless curiosity. Uh, the stove was booby-trapped with a teller mine, a, a teller anti-tank mine, the size of a large dinner plate and about four inches thick. 
designed to blow the treads off tanks <coughs> or demolish light vehicles. It exploded about 11 a.m. that awful November 30th morning. I was lucky to be shielded by one of the ammo bearers who had been standing between me and the stove, <coughs> so I only got hit with shrapnel that went between his legs. He was killed instantly, and he and I were blown into an armoire like closet, me face first, and I remember screaming and trying to push the dead guy on my back away from me. I couldn't even recognize the dead guy bleeding all over me. I recall having the sensation in that closet that I was dead and in an elevator going down to hell, and I remember yelling, no, no, no. I had originally thought only my squad had been in that kitchen but learned later that the remnants of all three mortar squads were there. Two men were killed and the rest of us all wounded. B Company mortar section was no more. Next slide. Until I got the guy off me and tried to stand up, I didn't know I was wounded with 13 pieces of shrapnel on my left leg. I finally realized that I was hit and not dead and my leg was starting to really hurt. The most amazing feeling came over me, a confusion, confusing mixture of anger and denial, absolute incredulity that it could happen to me, fear that I was hurt bad, and the helpless feeling wondering what was going to become of me. Next slide. I'd, no, same side. I'd like to quote a passage from James Jones' extraordinary book, World War II, about the different attitude everyone seems to have for the wounded. Jones writes, quote, something strange seems to happen when a man is hit. There is almost an alchemic change in him and in others' relationship to him. Assuming he isn't killed outright and is only wounded, it is as though he has passed through some veil isolating him and has entered some realm where others, the unwounded, cannot follow. He has become a different person and the others treat him differently. Perhaps we think some of their bad luck might rub off on us too. In any case, while they are treated by their comrades as tenderly and as humanly possible, and everything is done for them that can be, they are looked at with a sort of commingled distaste, guilt and irritation, and they, when they finally are moved out of the area, everybody heaves a sort of silent sigh of relief without looking anybody else in the eyes. The wounded themselves seem to acquiesce to this attitude as though they are half ashamed for having been hurt in the first place and feel now that they can only be a drag and wait on their outfit." End quote. Lying in the kitchen with the wall blown out, I could see everything going on in the town square. In spite of artillery shelling all around us, two guys went out with bazookas to force two of our regimental light Stuart tanks to give up their first aid kits, which included morphine, uh, before they were allowed to pass. They were running from the German tanks entering town from the north. Their situation was understandable. It would be suicide for a Stuart tank to try to t take on a Tiger. I got a shot of morphine and others in the basement did too. My pain drifted mostly away, but I felt forgotten. Guys kept carrying the wounded into the basement. I don't know how many died down there in the cellar, but occasionally one was brought up uh, and put out in the square. One guy, Sieberman, came running through the house with no mouth and blood streaming from the hole where his mouth had been. After a solid 88 round, apparently, went through the building he was in and just took his mouth and part of his jaw with it uh, as it went on through the buildings. I think he was trying to scream, but the sound was weirdly guttural, like he was choking. Others got him quieted and moved down into the basement. I imagine the basement was quite a scene of terror, with so many wounded guys crowded there and no help in sight. They probably fed on each other's despair, so Perhaps I was lucky to be up in the kitchen after all. Led by Master Sergeant Slaymaker, machine gun elements from B Company finally got to their objective 
Next slide. Uh, the Roar uh, River side of town and set up defensive positions. However, one of their own P-47 fighter bombers started to bomb and strafe them and the remnants had to evacuate their positions and go back into the town. That happened because the front line marker panels apparently hadn't, had been left behind in Garanischweiler. One of the unknown heroic jobs in World War II was putting down and taking up these large, brightly colored plastic panels which designated for our pilots where the front lines were. Anything on the German side of the panels was fair game for killing. The Air Force pilots saw all the activity we were making on the German side of the marker panels, assumed we were German and did what they were supposed to do. A few bombs hit near the town square and it was strafed once and I thought I should get down in the basement but was too scared and ashamed to ask for anything. When I got back to B Company after my stay in the hospital in England, I learned that one of our B Company guys named White used one of our Jeep mounted 50s to shoot back at the B-47 strafing us and one flew away trailing smoke. White was recommended for a Silver Star posthumously. However, the different official version of his award is shown on the slide. In that blown apart house in Welts, we learned that Captain Kinsey had been killed earlier and it seemed the war was lost. It was an emotional blow to many of us. We were told that he was trying to clean out a German machine gun nest and having run out of gr grenades, was trying to throw German stick grenades, but one blew up in his face. Knowing that Kinsey also was killed made it seem like the end of everything. I truly wanted to die as I lay there on that kitchen floor. Later in the day, when elements of the 406 Regiment finally came into town and fought their way out of town into the positions which had been our objectives, our own artillery and Air Force bombing had finally stopped and only the German artillery was coming in. Somehow everything seemed quiet and organized and we wounded wondered when, we were, uh, when we'd be able to get out. The 406 guys uh, seemed to be from a different army. They were alert and organized, moved out quickly and efficiently while we still felt numb, spaced out, beaten, useless. When they offloaded us in a dark driveway at the 406th Regimental Aid Station, no one knew where the 407th Aid was. Everything seemed tense and crazy again. A continuing stream of wounded, sometimes pretty vocal, were moved into the aid station to be worked on <coughs> until I alone was left outside in the alley. I didn't know that I was to be evacuated to a field hospital for my more serious wounds and lay on the litter in that dark driveway of the aid station for what seemed like hours. I was shaking from the cold and maybe shock or both, yet <coughs> the worst part was not knowing why I wasn't being cared for. I felt abandoned and useless and left out there to die. However, eventually my wounds got a loose field dressing and I was taken by Jeep to the field hospital in Maastricht, Holland, hours away. <coughs> in that Dutch hospital, I was prepped for leg amputation below the knee. I was drifting under the, as I was drifting under the anesthesia, I listened to a Dutch doctor arguing with the army doctors um, insisting he could probe for the pieces of shrapnel and save my leg. But the army doctors were insisting that there wasn't time and there was too much internal damage to the bone, tendons, nerves, and so on. Just as I was going unconscious, the Dutch doctor raised his voice and almost shouted his protest, I'm tired of assisting in bad decisions in my hospital, he yelled. When I came out of the anesthesia, a nurse was slapping me because he was, I was screaming about losing my leg. She told me to feel the leg and that it was there. I finally did as she insisted and was dumbfounded to realize that I still had my leg. 
Years later, after discharge, I tried to find out through Army records the name of the Dutch doctor who had saved my leg, but could find no record. After Maastricht, I was trucked back to the 16th General Hospital, a series of tents outside Liège, Belgium. We listened to uh, V-1 German bomb buzz bombs going over continually to targets in Liège or maybe England. Once a V-1 hit one of the tents in the hospital not far from ours, killing several of the wounded soldiers and wounding nurses. I felt helpless not being able to get up to help them. To me, those nurses in such forward areas were true heroes of World War II. After that V-1 hit, I was in a state of suspended waiting wondering why I was changing hospitals, but I didn't ask anyone. I didn't realize that each move was to a level of hospitalization farther from the front. At each level, the decision perhaps had been made that they couldn't handle my case. <clears throat> and then I'd be sent back farther in the hierarchy of the medical support system, or perhaps a combination of frostbitten feet and serious wounds slated me for England from the beginning. But no one told me. To me, it seemed more like a suspended judgment where I still might lose my leg. So I was worried of everything happening to me and didn't believe anything anyone told me. After a couple of days or so in the Liège Tent Hospital, I was entrained to Paris for an airlift to England. As I was being pulled out of the ambulance at the hospital in Paris, I was shocked into fury to see that the men carrying the stretcher were German soldiers still in uniform. As I had been trying to kill German soldiers on sight the past two months, without any conscious thought, I lunged at the one at my head, upsetting the treasure, stretcher, and I fell to the ground. <clears throat> the German prisoner whom I had tried to get at was crying as he was led away. While the American medic GI soothed me and got me quieted down. I was told later at that hospital that the German prisoners knew that if they dropped a wounded American GI, they would be taken out behind the hospital and shot. I felt better back in 1944 knowing that. After perhaps a day or two in the Paris hospital, I was taken to an airport and loaded into a C-54 aircraft for the flight to England. I was on the top row with the curve, the hull curving over my face. The plane seemed to drone on forever, and I floated in and out of sleep. There were a couple of nurses with us, and I remember that they seemed so tired and spaced out like we had been in combat. After three months in the hospital at Southampton, England, getting the best nursing care in the world, I can attest, I finally was declared ready to go back into combat. I remember being very depressed at the thought of going back, knowing I'd survived one impossible day at Welch and a month of combat before that, but how many more could I get away with? I knew that some of the old timers like the Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division, who had been fighting since 1942 in Africa, and although were few left getting into the Rhineland campaign, the lucky ones had been wounded numerous times and returned to the big one. Lucky not to be dead. When I left England, they sent me to the replacement depot at Givet, France, on the Belgian border. It was in a wonderful old castle, uh, high atop a cliff, overlooking a river, which was the Belgian-France border. We learned that because of the earlier German bulge attacks decimated the Green ASDP 104th and 106th Divisions, we would not get back to our own units, but instead would be sent to those divisions. We couldn't believe that we were being treated like new replacements to be shoved in anywhere needed and not get back to our buddies. Next As slide. noted in Stephen Ambrose's remarkable book, the uh, citizen soldiers, uh, the U.S. Army's replacement policy of keeping battle depleted units online and sending new men up and feeding them into the front lines was not practiced by all armies. The Russians had the same piecemeal replacement policy as the Americans, 
but the British and Germans withdrew beat up units out of combat, reinforced them with new men and equipment, good food and rest, and gave them all training together to feel connected and cohesive. The American flow of untrained recruits to depleted combat units resulted in veterans treating their replacements as expendable and placing them on point for patrols. They were often left to learn for themselves how to survive. Stephen Ambrose quote, it was to the obvious benefit the old boys to help the new kids, but nevertheless the veterans tried to avoid replacements. For one thing, the new men tend to draw fire because they bunched up and talk too much or lit cigarettes at night. For another, the old men just didn't want to make friends with guys who were expected to die soon." End quote. So you can understand why a few of us from the 102nd decided to go AWOL and try to get back to our own companies. Leaving the repo depot, as it was called then, was easy because there was little accountability for presence, you know, no morning roll call and uh, no guards, of course. We packed our duffel bags, slung them over our shoulders, and just walked out. We hitched rides and luckily didn't run across any officers who uh, would have asked what GIs with duffel bags were doing hitchhiking across Belgium. Going north and east, we finally made it to a British unit online. The British were cooperative enough to feed us and to assign one of their Bren gun carriers to show, show for us to our units. For a few hours, we accidentally crossed behind the German lines, but the Bren gun carrier guys realized our predicament and got us safely back to our, across our own lines. We eventually found where our units were. I hitchhiked on a two and a half ton army truck back to the 102nd Division area and finally found Company B dug in at Krefeld on the Rhine uh, where they had moved only 20 miles from where I had left them going through the secret line. The new B Company uh, commander, I didn't know him or he me, was amused at my AWOL and assured me that he would make sure it never got in my personnel file at Corps headquarters and that's a fact. The 102nd Division was in combat for another three months after Rester returned to his company shelling German positions across the Rhine, running endless patrols, and enduring constant day and night artillery duels, mostly sitting them out in foxholes. There were occasional casualties, but Resto was lucky not to be one again. The 102nd crossed the Rhine at Wesel in March 1945 and fought very light action across northern Germany, neither side wanting to do much fighting. They met the Russians at the Elbe River, northwest of Berlin, and after VE Day went into occupation duty for 10 long months in central and southern Germany before finally being allowed to return home. Any questions? Uh, I have one. Uh, according to Stephen Ambrose, there was, at that time in December and January 44-45, along this, the line, the Siegfried line, and the Hurtgen Forest, is that how you pronounce that? Mm -hmm. There was 1.3 million total troops, both sides. Did it ever, ever seem to you that there was that many? Oh no, you know, we often didn't even know where we were. We weren't privy to maps or, or discussions uh, about strategy or tactics. So, um, you know, we're told to take that town, so we did. And uh, that's, that's all we knew. We knew the names, Welts and Kyle Kirk and, and uh, Garen Schweiler and Puffendorf, Emmendorf and so on. But we didn't know where they were. We had no idea that there were 30 divisions in five armies along the German border uh, trying to get through the secret line. That was an enormous undertaking. The, the uh, uh, Allies were kind of surprised at how easy it was to get across France and Belgium. 
and so they weren't really prepared for uh, fighting through a secret line. They had no time to uh, do anything except, as we said, throw men against pillboxes. Any other questions? How has your leg treated you in the years since World War II? I'm sorry? How has your leg treated you? Your leg How is it? How it's great. It's been really hardly any problem. Actually, my right knee is, is uh, more of a problem, and I hurt that after in, in occupation, uh, which, as Colonel Burns said, was 10 months we were in occupation. Uh, the combat troops didn't get to go home first. But my right knee was hurt playing touch football uh, with the guys in B Company, and that gave me a lot of problems. Uh, you, you showed a slide with, the, I think, a Stewart tank? I'm sorry? With, uh, you showed a slide with the Stewart tank and a tank? Yes. Were there any Shermans? Oh yeah, there were Shermans, but the Shermans weren't really a match for the Tigers anyway until the end of the war, when the Shermans finally got the 90 millimeter cannon that the tank destroyers had before that. The Shermans had, uh, was it 75? Yeah. And the Stuarts were attached to infantry divisions as scout tanks. They didn't have um, yeah. combined arms armor, so unless an armor, you the know. The Tigers yeah. were awesome. They were invincible. And what were they used for? Were they uh, infantry? Were they, how were they? How did the Germans what? use the Tigers? Stewards? No, the Tigers. The, I think the Germans were using more, rather than using arm and division together, they, they'd combine. But units in those days were together mostly, um, but even an armored unit would have infantry attached to it as well. But yeah, the, the, German, yeah. the German response to any attack was to counterattack with their panzer divisions. So they, they used them and, and sometimes men, Germans, rode on them. And we learned that, I read. Uh, and so uh, Patton's tanks did the same thing. And uh, we learned that they were very mobile. That way you could move a whole army just with the tanks. So the, the Tigers, though, were Something you don't want to know. I have another question. They, uh, again, I'll refer to Ambrose's book. That uh, he mentions more than once that officers very rarely were on the front line. That's very the, true. That's uh, one little short story. When we were in Bergen, uh, to just over the border into German, Germany from Holland, uh, we were doing a kind of a holding action. The patrols were going out every night, but uh, and the mortarmen had to fire day and night. But uh, there wasn't much combat going on, uh, and we were eating pretty well. We had a, a kitchen that we were using, you know, to cook uh, animals that we found: pork and beef and chickens and. Uh, the, our, our uh, battalion command heard about it and came down to visit us. They wanted to get some good food. And so we feeded them. We uh, put on a real good show for them. They were doing all of the military stuff of asking us where our uh, posts were and, and you know where our mortar holes were and all that. And they asked, where is your ammunition stored? And we told them in the basement of the building that they were in. They didn't even finish that bite. They just got up and left. We never saw them after that. The only officers we saw, of course, were our company commander and our, our platoon leaders. We never saw a regimental uh, or a, a division. Ambrose did mention one a British general who visited the 102nd and was appalled to learn that nobody ever went up to the front lines to see what the troops were being faced with, but that they were sending them, what they were sending them to do. Um, 
He also was appalled that we got no hot food. Uh, the British apparently got hot meals even in the middle of combat. And he, he couldn't believe that we were using rations uh, and, and whatever we might find. I wanted you to share your coming home story since it was very delayed. It wasn't parades. So could what, what? the coming home, the train station? Oh, well, I got rolled in Grand Central Station. I was trying to sleep on a on a uh, stairway. Um, you know, in combat, y you have no place to sleep and, uh, and uh, no toilet facilities, uh, sometimes no food. And so you, you sort of slept when you could. Uh, often you were too tired to get much sleep, but occasionally you'd have a space that you could get. Uh, you know, five or six hours. Uh, so it was nothing for me to go to sleep on a stairway. Um, but I didn't realize that there was a, a guy who pickpocketed me. He rolled me over, grabbed my wallet and ran as I woke up and I chased him. But there's just so many people there that uh, I, uh, I lost him in the crowd. I had no ticket to go home and no money and no ID. And there was a USO station there, booth there in the Grand Central Station. And they bought me another ticket and fed me. And uh, so I got home. <clears throat> Any other? You, you mentioned that uh, there was a German trying to surrender and ended up getting shot. Was it a let's take no prisoners policy? Was that basically it? It wasn't a policy. We were just trained. Uh, you got to realize that combat is an insanity that no human being would want to do. And so they had to train us. They, uh, trained us not only how to kill, but to want to kill. And uh, it's, you know, the Russians treated the Germans the same way. The Germans killed 27 million Russians. And when the Russians we met on the uh, Elbe River, uh, if the German was alive, you shot him. It's that simple. And we, ha we had that attitude trained into us also. What day to day was so horrible for you? What kept you going day after day through all mm, this? I don't know. I really don't. You know, when I think back, what we were asked to do to go against pillboxes, uh, I, I don't know why we did. We just did. We were told to, so we did. I don't have any, any, uh, patriotic reason to give you, I'm sorry. Yes, Carol? Was it the camaraderie and the sort of buddy system maybe that... Oh, yes. You? The, 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 uh, I think, I think the bottom line on the things like the, the, the brotherhood of, of combat veterans is that, uh, you learn what has to be done, and you see a guy that needs help, you help him. He doesn't have to call and ask for anything, he, he, and you you're operate as a, as a unit that way. Everybody is part of the unit. Everybody is helping everybody else. And uh, you know that uh, if you don't keep him alive, he can't keep you alive. So. Uh, it, it's more than a camaraderie. It's a kind of love that, uh, you know, doesn't have anything to do with sex, but it is a, a love, a deep, deep love that you have for your fellow buddies. When they're killed, it's, uh, it's many years to get, old, get past 
feeling grieving about it. You said you never knew exactly where you were because you didn't look at maps. Did you ever go back later after the war and take a look and see and trace your... No, no, I have sort of wanted to, but I really don't want to. You know, it's, there's too much, uh, there's too many memories that I don't really want. And uh, most of my division is buried at, in the Gardelagen, I'm sorry, in the Margratten Hospital, uh, the Margratten Cemetery in uh, uh, Holland. And uh, I've always wanted to go there and find the B Company. I will add there's a video on YouTube, Return to Welts, Google that of one of the veterans who did return, and the pictures of the field were of the actual field pulled from that video. Uh, given your experiences, do you have any opinions on the way the war, uh, World War II was portrayed in the media afterwards in the films? I'm sorry? Do you have any opinions about how the war was portrayed afterwards in the films and the media and uh, the movies and Hollywood? Most of them, of course, are artificial, but there's been a few good ones. Um, uh, the Big Red One with Lee Marvin in it is one of the best, I think. It goes from the uh, Big Red One in Africa through all of the Big Red One's combat. And uh, it's with one squad, actually just three guys that are surviving, and Lee Marvin is the sergeant. And uh, to me it portrayed very succinctly the endlessness of combat. It, it gave you the feeling that we had of, you know, you just go on and on and on. You don't know what's going to happen. And uh, those guys had it for four years. That's, that's just not, that's, we shouldn't do that to human beings. But, uh, let's see, others? You know most of the of the books and movies. Oh, Band of Brothers, I understand, is good. Uh, Finding Private Ryan, I thought had a lot of realism in it, but I didn't really like the movie. I don't know why, I just didn't. And the Fury was the first one to cover the armored version. Mm -hmm. I mean, just went, how did you... Did you go through the Normandy beaches when you arrived? Uh, where did you go? No, we landed at Cherbourg in uh, August. Oh, prior to the landing, but the invasion? No, after. Oh, after. Oh, the invasion was July, uh, January. June. June, yeah. June 6th. And we were there uh, on the beaches. Our Captain Kinsey took us. Uh, hiking on the beaches because he wanted us to see uh, was soon enough after D-Day that everything was still pretty much disrupted and uh, they had taken the dead away but most of the damaged equipment was still there. What was the typical age of your buddies? How old were they? I'm sorry? How old, How old were your were buddies? I, I still How old were your buddies? What was the average age? Of oh, your, well, your almost age? all of the uh, uh, ASTP guys, which was half of the division, uh, were my age. I was 19 uh, at Welts. And uh, the older guys from the cadre that uh, started, the 102nd Division failed. Uh, Maneuvers, which is sort of a final exam before they're sent overseas. We understood that the command section had failed. The troops were pretty well trained. And what they did was uh, take half of the men from the 102nd Division and send them overseas for replacements uh, after D-Day. And the other half uh, stayed and that cadre were the ones that trained us ASTP guys. So half of the men, roughly, were ASTP and half were cadre. The cadre were a bit older. Uh, they were mostly uneducated, uh, but they were great men. 
I will add in the ASTP, it was a 50-50 chance if you got sent over like Joseph Heller as an individual replacement with just basic training, no fitting in with men and just thrown at the front. And a lot of those guys didn't last more than a week. Um, no, Francis true. was in one of the expansion divisions. If you're going to be going to the front, that was the lucky half that actually got to train with the unit in the States before they went over and said just, uh, it was very similar to Vietnam. There's a lot of parallels as far as individual guys roting, rotating in towards the end of the war there. Uh, because the division had not had a final maneuvers, uh, you know, uh, a final exam, before we went over, we were first attached by different, each regiment in 102nd Division was attached to um, a different uh, unit. We were attached to the 29th Infantry Division, and uh, that would give our command section some experience. And then we finally got all together for the attack on Guyland Curtain. You had this extra slide. I was just wondering if that was another part of your talk. The the talk has been used in different forms. This was given to my medical unit back in 2014. It was a different talk at the time, um, um, focusing on more the combat stress elements, and I had to put up the comparative casualties just to give an idea of the intensity of the war compared to uh, the current operations we've been in. And uh, Sergeant Bergdahl has uh, been found <laughs> since then. Are there any other questions? I, I could talk all night, and I want to point out that I had therapy starting with in uh, 1990. Uh, I didn't tell my kids or my wife at the time uh, that I had even been in the war. Most combat veterans do not want to talk about it, can't talk about it. Uh, after all the therapy I've had for all these decades, uh, I can talk about it, and so I want to. I want people to hear uh, what it was like. Because most combat veterans, you're not going to get anything out of them. They they can't really talk because it's such a different world. It's a, it's a, there's just no way to explain it. Before you had therapy, were you able to talk about it then? Or no, no, no. I didn't talk to anybody about it. Didn't tell my kids. My, my son was really surprised. He was about 12, I think, when I started therapy and he learned that I have been a combat veteran. Anne Bruce's book is one that uh, the Citizen Soldiers uh, by uh, Stephen Ambrose. If you want to see what war was really like, read some of his stuff. His, his Citizen Soldiers has two halves. First half is the D-Day invasion. Second half was the Rhineland campaign that I was in. And uh, that book is very real, very real. He talks about all the things that, that hit a person. Do the medals mean anything, the awards and the recognitions afterwards? Do I'm they sorry? mean anything? The, med the medals and ribbons, what do they mean to you? Well, I'm, I'm proud. Uh, this is a bronze star. This is a purple heart. And uh, these are the service medals. This, of course, is a division patch. And these, this is the Civil Air Patrol wings, pilot wings. Uh, Actually, I'm, I'm most proud of the CIB, the Combat Infantry Badge, because only infantry can wear it. 
Uh, even Marines can't. They have another one that's similar, but theirs came out after, so theirs is second class. And I, I will say, uh, I pointed out to the cadets, the, the Bronze Star's somewhat unique in that his unit, who was in battle that day, was given the Bronze Stars, I think, in the 1970s. Everybody that was in combat November 30 at Welts was issued a Bronze Star. So I don't know of any other unit that was so awarded. We also got a, a unit citation that, that I haven't worn there, uh, which was also for Welts. Welts was a bad time. Well, I guess that's about it, unless we have someone new that wants to ask a question. Um, your transition back into civilian life. I can hear you. Your transition back into civilian life. How, how did that go for you? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. Most veterans that came home uh, felt very much uh, honored and they were told over and over that they were heroes and all that but I had experience more like the Vietnam veterans where I was an officer's son but I was a sergeant when I got home and you know uh, 15 million troops came home and there weren't enough clothes for 15 million uh, people to buy so it took quite a while for all of the tailors and the seamstresses to make suits for everybody. So I was in my uniform for quite a bit. One time I was walking at home at West Point in the academic area and ran into a previous school buddy of mine, Lee Parmley, and he and I, you know, we hugged him and were talking animatedly and so on, and Officer beckoned Lee over across the street and he I could see that Lee was being really chewed out and uh, so Lee came back across and said I gotta go and I said it looked like he, he was chewing you out and he said yeah loitering between classes and a couple of nights later uh, Walcott Parmley my uh, Lee's younger brother and my younger brother Rodney uh, had talked about that incident and Rodney uh, said something about how tough it was for Lee, all of the demerits he got uh, from seeing me. And uh, he'd be walking that area the way the West Point cadets had to if they got demerits. <clears throat> he'd be walking for months. And I said, for loitering between classes? He said, no, for talking to an enlisted man. And that was the kind of feelings that I got. And also you came back 10 months at the, after the war is over because of the occupation duties. Yeah. And so every story's already been told, all the parades are over, everybody's getting on and he's just coming back that much later. Versus, Schools. we kind of contrasted, I was, uh, you know, IED hit my Humvee, 10 days later I'm at back to school night at Cesar Chavez, you know. Yeah, it was just the opposite, you know. It was, well, so going, that's kind of why I was reaching out to him because I wasn't really. Uh, you know, going home the was all we ever talked, uh, thought about. We, uh, the war was over. We were citizen soldiers. We'd been in to win the war, and now we want to go home. And of course, we couldn't. Uh, you got to realize there were 13 million troops overseas. And you can't take them all home very rapidly. So they had a point system, which uh, those with the most medals got to go home. Of course, the Navy had their own transportation. They went home. Uh, the Air Force had points for flying over a battle zone. Uh, my division had just three battles. And an Air Force guy would have 20 or 30 battle stars and uh, that was three points each so uh, the 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 uh, medals didn't get down to the 
to the uh, unit. You know, when you're in combat, who's going who's to uh, come talk to you or write about you or bring a medal? Uh, it just didn't happen in, in the Rhineland campaign. We never saw a USO. We were never relieved. Uh, never, never went back to rest. Uh, and so there was just no occasion for anybody to give us a medal. Yes. But in combat, you're, you had to kill people and you were living in muck and dirt and you weren't eating and probably cussing or whatever. And then you come home to West Point where everybody has certain behavioral norms. How did you transition from such dark extremes? Well, I think, I think the, uh, the only answer to that was that I didn't, except that my dad talked to me. Uh, he'd come home early from work, and all the rest of the day and the evening and every weekend for the six months before I went to college, he talked to me and talked to me and talked to me. And that, I think, sort of reacultured me and made me a, a human being that I, I kept some contact with, with my buddies, but they were all kind of lost souls. Like Big Jim O'Brien had been uh, in the company for all 196 days that, that, that the, the company was online. And he never had a break. He wasn't lucky. He didn't get wounded. So um, he was really screwed up. And uh, all of them were, and I, I just, I, I hate to say it, but I, I started not wanting to see them anymore because they were screwed up and I wasn't. At least, <laughs> mostly I wasn't. You buried, you buried it so that you could go on and, and sort of live, you know, get married and have a family. Oh, yeah. I went to college and... Uh, I've, I've had a good life. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.